Bienvenidos a la Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores Unidad Morelia. Por favor, en caso de emergencia, siga las siguientes recomendaciones. Ante todo, mantenga la calma. Siga las reglas básicas. Atienda las indicaciones del personal autorizado. Camine siempre en fila por la derecha y siga la ruta de evacuación marcada. No busque los objetos de valor ni los recoja. Solo diríjase a la salida. Apoye a las personas con dificultades. En caso de humo, agáchese y gatee. Ubique las salidas de emergencia. Y diríjase al punto de reunión. Por su atención, gracias. Vamos a empezar con el seminario de la doctora Shelly Adamo. Eh, muchísimas gracias a todos los estudiantes por andar acá, a los profesores, a todo el mundo. Eh, pues les voy a platicar así muy rápido de, del currículum de nuestra invitada. Ella es bióloga de la Universidad de McGill, ella es canadiense y después estuvo haciendo un par de postdocs, uno de ellos con con Nancy Beckers, una investigadora muy famosa en el campo de la inmunología y posteriormente eh, encontró trabajo en, en Halifax, en, en la Universidad de Dalhousie, en Canadá. Ella es una persona muy sencilla, pero realmente como investigadora es muy grande, es, es, ha sido editora de varias revistas importantes, miembro de comité editorial, miembro revisor en varios países, es invitada, profesor invitado en un montón de universidades. Y algo muy importante, aparte de eso, es que ha logrado cambiar la forma en que los ecólogos hacíamos fisiología. Cuando yo estaba en el doctorado, hacíamos de fisiología como de una manera muy burda, ¿no? pero eran las herramientas que teníamos en ese momento. Y entonces, un día que leí un artículo del 2004 de Shelley Adamo, donde decía cómo los ecólogos deberíamos hacer inmunología, eso cambió la visión no solamente de, de mi parte, sino de la de muchos colegas a nivel mundial. Y entonces todo el mundo volteó a ver quién era Shelly Adamo y qué hacía Shelly Adamo. Y ella es una de las fundadoras de una, de una área reciente en ecología que se llama la inmunología ecológica. Es, es realmente, aquí en México eh, hay muy pocos investigadores en esta área y Shelly colabora mucho con nosotros para impulsar la ecoinmunología y la inmunología evolutiva en México, aunque es la primera vez que viene a México porque siempre tiene mucho trabajo y por videoconferencia siempre ha estado en contacto con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias, Shelly. Thank you so much for that introduction. I didn't understand it, but thank you. I bet it was good. And I, I thank you all for allowing me to give this speech, uh, this talk in um, English, because my Spanish is, I, I know 10 words and I've used all of them. You can talk to the people I was talking to this afternoon and they heard all 10. Um, but what I, and I also thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk to you today about some research we've been doing in our lab. So. One question that I think, or one area that, that has a lot of interest to people, is how other organisms can hijack the brain. So we know that some parasites can do that, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. We're going to learn about the mechanisms. Before I do that, this is like a, a message from my sponsor. I promised my friend, oh, wait, 
nope, never mind. I'm not going to show that slide, so never mind. So first of all, let me start by saying parasites have to manipulate their hosts, all parasites, because if they don't, they'll be destroyed by the host's immune system. So a successful parasite, by definition, is an organism that can somehow hide from its host, alter the way its host's immune system works. It has to do something. But the type of manipulators I'm interested in are the ones that can change an animal's behavior. So these ones are given a special name. They're called parasitic manipulators, and they actively change the behavior of their host to benefit themselves. And this has been known for a few hundred years. Naturalists have recognized that this occurs. And we're only now seeing it everywhere. It seems to be much more prevalent than we thought. But the, the question of how has been harder to answer. And really, people have only been working on that the last 20 years. But if you think about it, if you're a parasite and you want to control your host behavior to benefit you in some way, you are going to have trouble doing it unless you can control the brain. Control the brain, and you control the behavior. But how do you do that? And so I've been really um, excited about embarking on this study, because I think parasites have something to teach us. Parasites are nature's neurobiologists. They know something about the brain that we don't know, because they can do things we can't when it comes to manipulating nervous systems. So if we look at their methods, maybe it will teach us something. The problem with this question is that if you want to know how something is doing something, it really helps if you know what that, how that thing is supposed to work. And we don't know how brains work. And so this is an, an added problem for this field. So I'll talk about how we try to get around that. But at the moment, we do not really know how brains work. Now, that's not to say we don't know anything. So as neurobiologists, how do we figure out how brains work? One of the tried and true methods we have used for over a century is we know that if you lesion or stimulate particular brain areas, be that in an insect or a frog or a snake or um, a mammal, you can get particular behaviors because there's a certain modularity to the brain. Certain parts of the brain control certain behaviors. So we can do this, and we can, we're quite successful at it as neurobiologists. And so specific brain, uh, certain abilities and behaviors are wired by specific brain areas. So we know these brain areas, we can stimulate them, and we can get all sorts of different behaviors. Just to show you an example, this is a very fat rat. You can make a very fat rat by lesioning a particular part of the ventral medial hypothalamus, because that part of the brain controls appetite. And this poor rat doesn't know when to quit now, because you've destroyed the part of his brain that tells him he's full. So he just keeps eating. So these are the sorts of experiments people have done in the past. And it's really helped us understand how the brain works. Another thing that we have discovered about brains is they use specific chemicals. Neurons, brain cells, spit chemicals at each other, and that's how they communicate. And these chemicals are called neurotransmitters. It turns out that the different neurotransmitters in the brain follow particular circuits. So they're not just anywhere in the brain. They usually follow a pathway. And it turns out, again, if you manipulate these specific pathways with drugs that specifically activate these neurotransmitter systems, you can get specific behaviors. So in other words, drugs, we've now developed drugs. And we have used this information to help, say, um, uh, help people with mental disorders like depression. So what we do is we design drugs to hit a particular neurotransmitter system, and so we change behavior. That doesn't really work so well, and that's where I think parasites can sometimes help us. To try to understand how parasites do things, 
because they're not really neurobiologists like we are neurobiologists. So let me just show you some of the differences. So let's take a disease like rabies. So rabies is a classic parasitic manipulator. It's a virus. So parasitic manipulators, just by the way, can be anything from a virus to a macro parasite. All different levels of pathogens have come up with tricks to control host behavior. So in rabies, you have the dog, the rabbit dog, bites your hand, not your hand, I hope, somebody's hand. The virus enters into the neurons and is carried up the peripheral nerves to the brain. Once it's in there, if you're a dog, once it's in there, it causes the dog to become hyper-aggressive, wants to bite, and it drools because the virus is in the saliva, it's in the drool. So it does these two things. So people thought, when they first were thinking about this, is that the virus, they predicted, would target a part of the brain called the amygdala. Because the amygdala is very important for emotional behavior, and in dogs and other mammals, if you lesion particular parts and stimulate particular parts of the amygdala, you can get aggressive behavior. So it seemed like that, well, that's how the virus must do it. But it doesn't. So when they looked to see where the virus was in the brain, well, sometimes it was in the amygdala. Mostly, it was everywhere. It wasn't completely random, but almost. So if you looked at the, the brain of a person or a dog who was now suffering from behavioral changes due to rabies, the virus is everywhere. So it's a shotgun approach. No neuroanatomical specificity and no neuropharmacological specificity. The two main ways human neurobiologists control behavior is not what parasitic um, manipulators do. So how does rabies then change behavior? We don't know, but there's a group in Thailand who's been working on this for the last 20 years, and uh, their best guess is neuroinflammation is part of it, but we don't know. All right, so parasitic manipulators are not targeting particular areas of brain anatomy, and they're not going after specific brain chemicals as a rule. So what are they doing? So let me tell you what they do. So this is what we found so far. These are the common methods parasitic manipulators use. They produce pharmacologically active substances like venoms, but they typically release them as a cocktail. They don't just release one or two, they release, you know, like 20. They interfere with the host's normal mechanism of behavioral regulation. So they manipulate their hormonal levels, and they manipulate their neuroimmunological connections. They also induce genomic and proteomic changes in the brain. So to show you that in more detail, I'm going to tell you about the system I work on because it uses all of those methods. So the system I work on is the host is this caterpillar here called Manduca sexta, and that wasp is the parasitic wasp called Catesia congregata. So those are our, I guess they're not our heroes, they're our topics for the rest of the talk. It's a very large caterpillar. No, it's not that big. The caterpillar has been used as a model for insect physiology since the 1930s. So we know a lot about this caterpillar. Let me just go over the life cycle for you. So what happens is the adult female fly looks for a caterpillar. When she finds a caterpillar, let me get the mouse, maybe that'll work better. Oh, there we go. Then when she finds her caterpillar, she oviposits the eggs directly into the body. The eggs hatch out and they live in the blood. They drink the blood, they're like little vampires. But they don't damage any tissue, no tissue damage. During this time, there are no behavioral changes in the host. So you can have 10, 20, 100, 200 of these wasp larvae inside you. Well, not you again, the caterpillars. And there'll be no change in the caterpillar behavior. At some point, the caterpillars need to get out of the host. So what they do 
is they drill their way out. They use their mouth parts. Here's the wasp. These are little wasp larvae. They're almost fully mature, and they're getting ready to basically chew their way out of the host. And here I'm going to show you a video because you don't want to miss that. So let me see if I can get this to go. Oh, it has the plastic on it. No, that'll help. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, I can see it. You can't see it. Oops. Let's see if we wiggle this a little bit. Oh, there it is. Okay. Before we lose the picture, I'm quickly going to show you what it looks like when the wasps emerge. So here you see they've, they're squeezing their way out of these holes that they've made in the host. So here, there's one squeezing its way out. You could turn the light down if you really want the full effect. And as soon as they're out, you see they're very busy. They're busy spinning a cocoon because they need to pupate. So they're going to spin a cocoon. Here they are spinning the cocoon. Notice that the host isn't doing very much. Oh, and now they've gone through their metamorphosis. Here are the cocoons. And now the wasp is going to come out, ready for the next cycle. Now notice, the caterpillar is not dead. This is important. OK, so that is the, the wonderful video I was going to show you. So let's just go back. All right, sorry about that. Whoop. And no, it's done now, thanks. And so, uh, there we go. So, so they, they scrape their way through the host. They take four to five days to pupate. And then, as we saw, they come out as adult wasps. And during this time, they're connected to the host. But the host uh, doesn't die. And as a matter of fact, the host can live for another week after the wasps, week, sometimes two weeks, after the wasps have emerged. They will never pupate, though. And it starves to death. And we're going to talk about that, because that caterpillar is never eating again. So they survive. I wouldn't say they thrive afterwards, but they don't die. So for the wasp to pull this off, this is actually a remarkable example of evolution. To pull this off, the wasp has to do a lot of things. And we know how most of this works. We know how it, it, it hides from the host's immune system. That's not my work. It's really exciting, but I'm not going to talk about it. The host endocrine system, basically the wasp takes over, becomes the master gland for the caterpillar. But I'm not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about host behavior. The host needs to be able, or I should say the wasp needs to be able to do three things. It needs to prevent the host from attacking it as it's drilling its way out. Can you imagine if something was drilling out of you? Wouldn't you scratch it? Wouldn't you notice? This is a major thing. They've got to prevent that. They need a bodyguard to defend them. Because as we're going to learn, things are after those cocoons. It needs a friend. It wants the host to be its friend. And it also needs the host to stop feeding. So oh, I, this was, uh, this, I was just going to show you what caterpillar defense looks like. So caterpillars, we don't think of them as ferocious animals, and they're not. But they do have their defense maneuvers. And one is defensive strike. So this is Manduca sexta. If you pinch it, it's very sensitive. Its skin is very sensitive. If you pinch it, it will whirl around and try to bite at whatever is pinching it. So I think you can appreciate if you're a wasp and you're digging a hole, the, wa the caterpillar is going to turn around and munch you. So how are we going to prevent that? Because as we saw from that video, they're not doing any defensive strikes. It turns out they numb the caterpillar just around the area that the wasp is coming through. Just like the dentist numbs your gum, it numbs that little piece of, of skin and it crawls through it. So this is looking at the zone of numbness. And it's, it's only a millimeter or so around the, the exit hole. And it, but even on the day that they're emerging, if you go further away from the exit hole, they're still sensitive. 
So this is really like a local anesthetic. It really is like what the dentist does. So it's numbing it up just where it's, it's, um, just where it's coming out, but it, it's fine one day later. So this is a temporary, a temporary numbness, just like at the dentist. We wanted to know what this thing was because this could be a new novel local anesthetic, maybe, and I'd like to know how it works. You can culture the wasp larvae and you can harvest their secretions. And we looked on, uh, we just did some simple protein work and we didn't find very much. So now we have to do advanced proteomics, which I'm doing with my colleague David Biron in France. And we just started this work, but basically um, we have now found proteins that are unique and we're just trying to identify them now. So, so sorry, that just can't give you the punchline, but we're, we're hot on the trail. Oh, yes, this is just showing you how hot, how hot we are on the trail. This is looking um, just at some of the, that there are some novel proteins in the wasp larvae salivary glands, and some of these proteins may be involved with that local anesthetic. That's what we hope anyway. Okay, we also, we need a friend if we're a wasp larvae and we're a cocoon, because things are gonna eat us. And um, uh, you can see this because if you take wasp cocoons and put them all by themselves, very few of them will hatch. Uh, insect predators will get at them, they'll, they'll get fungi, things will happen to them, bad things. Not only that, but there are particular wasps in a kind of natural justice system, who specialize on parasitizing other parasitic wasp cocoons. So these are called hyperparasitoids, and these females only lay their eggs inside the cocoons of developing parasitic wasps. And this is what they need their host to defend them for, from. And sure enough, the host isn't numb anymore, and if there's any wasps, bothering the cocoons, it'll turn around and do that defensive strike. Uh, this is just showing you defensive strike. Here's a parasitized caterpillar. All these little dots are where a cocoon used to be. I just clipped the silk that connects them. And you can, you know, pinch with a forcep and you can see that they have extremely robust defensive strike. So these are not debilitated caterpillars. I want to point that out. They're, they're quite uh, pale. And so that means the wasp gets a bodyguard. The last thing I want to talk about, and we'll spend more time on this, is the, 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 the wasp needs to make sure the caterpillar never eats again when it comes out as a cocoon because the caterpillar likes to eat cocoons. So you can't, if you're the wasp, from the wasp perspective, that's a bad thing. And so you don't want to get eaten by your host. These are just a, I had just glued on a couple of uh, wasp uh, um, cocoons onto this normal caterpillar and it's chowed through them. So they'll do that. So ideally, the wasp needs a zombie caterpillar. It needs a caterpillar that will do its bidding, will protect it from predators, but won't eat and really won't move much. Just stay there. The problem is, how do you do that? Because if you think about a caterpillar, when it's not parasitized, a normal caterpillar is an eating machine. That is the stage of life it needs to bulk up for its, its reproduction. And its fitness depends on being fat. So that's a major drive in these animals. How are you going to switch that drive off? So they do not eat. I'm just showing you this. Uh, this um, little graph, but just trust me, they don't eat. But how do they do it? And this is part most, to me, the most fascinating part of the story because they use a whole suite of different mechanisms. One thing they don't do, what do they not do? No neuroanatomical <laughs> specificity. The wasp larvae never touch the brain. They never touch it. So the brain is completely physically intact. So there's no physical damage. Oh, that was actually a picture, an x-ray, a CT scan, basically, of the caterpillar, uh, and just to show that its brain is still intact. What does it do then? Well, one of the things that happens 
is that during wasp development, when it's inside the host, the host's immune system can't see it. It's like it's invisible. But as soon as the wasps start to chew their way out, they induce a massive immune response in the host. This is just one example. The number of immune cells in the blood, the hemocytes, that number falls by a half at emergence. That's partly because the, the cells are forming clots to prevent the host from bleeding to death out those holes. But it, 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 there's, I can show you more data, but I won't. But there's all different measures we can look at. But the immune system just goes off the charts in terms of activity. Because I want to talk about this a little bit, and I know not everyone here is an insect immunologist, which is too bad, but I know it's not true. So let's talk, just let me walk you through a little bit of insect immunity. So insects have immune cells in their blood, like our white blood cells and that's cell-mediated immunity. It also has humoral immunity, so that oops, when it's infected, it can, um, the fat body, which is an immune organ, can produce antimicrobial peptides. As well, you get the activation of immune regulatory molecules called cytokines. And they're the neurotransmitters of the immune system. They coordinate the immune system. And they, uh, so you can have, uh, that helps form the clots. And then you have other enzymes that help to clear pathogens from the, the organism. I want to talk a little bit about cytokines. So these are the immune uh, generated molecules that activate the immune system, that tell the immune system it's time to turn on. And the one plasmatocyte spreading peptide, PSP, is a very important one in uh, Manduka. And cytokines we have now know, we have known this in vertebrates for at least 20 years, and it's not as well known in invertebrates, but we also know that those regulatory molecules don't just talk to other immune cells, they talk to the brain. The immune system talks to the brain because the brain is listening for cytokines. And when it, when it hears cytokines, because there are receptors for cytokines in the brain, you get a change in behavior called sickness behavior. And I'm sure, unfortunately, all of us have probably experienced this. Humans have it. When you get sick, think about the last time you had a cold or the flu. You had some changes in behavior. You weren't your chipper self. You were lethargic. You probably lost your appetite. That's sickness behavior. It turns out that those sorts of things happen in insects too. So when the insect activates, plasmatocyte, plasmatocyte spreading peptide can go into the brain and also activate neurons. And it, in these changes in behavior we know increase the chance of recovery in Manduca sexta and other insects. So it plays a role. And just, this is just showing you if we inject heat-killed bacteria so they can't cause disease, it's like a vaccination, and uh, you will see that they have a depression in their feeding. So they don't eat as much. This is looking at bite rate. Their bite rate declines. So this is their illness, what's called illness-induced anorexia. You can also inject the cytokine uh, plasmatocyte spreading peptide. It exists in the inactive pro form or the active form. If you inject the inactive form, you don't see an effect. But if you inject the active form, you will suppress feeding. So cytokines will suppress feeding in Manduka. If you look at the expression of this cytokine during the time the wasp is in the, is in the caterpillar, it has this huge surge just at the time of emergence. So just as the, the wasps are drilling away through the host, one of the reasons the host's immune system takes off is that there's a massive release of um, uh, uh, pro-plasmatocyte-spreading uh, peptide. So what we're su suggesting, although it's not definitive yet, is that the poor caterpillar is suffering from a cytokine storm. That's a massive release of cytokines. Can happen to can happen to people too. It has some benefits to the wasp. It reduces host bleeding, promotes wound healing, and reduces the risk of infection. Because of course, the wasps need the host to be alive for at least a few days. So 
It's all good, all good for the wasp. What I hypothesize is going on here is that the wasps have actually co-opted a normal regulatory signal that the, wa the, the caterpillar usually uses for its own benefit and it's augmented, it's made it huge, it's, it's made it, it's increased it to above what would you ever see, what the caterpillar would ever use normally, causing a deep depression in feeding behavior. So you would think, okay, that's enough, that we should be done now. We now understand how the wasp suppresses feeding. It causes a massive cytokine increase, and that's it. No, <laughs> there's more. So it turns out that another molecule that's released during an immune challenge is the stress neurohormone octopamine. The neurohormone octopamine is released by the brain. It can, it can interact with um, receptors on the immune cells, the hemocytes. And it also increases in the blood during an immune challenge. So if you give heat-killed bacteria, you get a stress response. That's just like you. If I gave you um, a vaccination, for example, you would have a mild stress response. So the immune system and stress response, they often work together. So it's not that much of a surprise. So here's some heat-killed bacteria. We see the increase in octopamine in Manduka. It turns out octopamine also suppresses feeding in Manduka. So it's another, another compound that tends to depress feeding. What happens to octopamine when those wasps are drilling their way out of the host? It has an enormous increase. It increases five times, much higher than you would see in a typical infection. So again, it's causing a super threshold response in its host, and it stays high, actually, for a couple of days. It turns out that the wasps are not the source of the octopamine, and we do not believe the wasps are the source of the cytokine. Those compounds are being made by the host. The wasps are getting the hosts to do their work for them. So what's happening then is that the parasite, the wasps, are causing a super high activation of the immune system causing super high levels of the cytokine PSP and the neurohormone octopamine, and together it causes severe depression of feeding. So you might think, well, okay, so now we know the answer, right? No, because those things don't last very long. The octopamine levels decline, they don't return to baseline, but by the time the day two, it's not high enough to suppress feeding anymore. You need really high levels to suppress feeding. And the PSP, the cytokine, it's gone. So why doesn't it start eating the, the wasp cocoons after day two? So this is where we went into the nervous system to see what was going on in the nervous system of the caterpillar. First, let's pretend, pretend you wanted to stop the caterpillar from eating. Think about the ways you might pick. What could you do? Well, maybe you would take away the caterpillar's ability to taste. If they can't taste anything, they're not going to eat. So doing this with my collaborator, Carol Miles, we recorded from the chemosensory fibers coming from the caterpillar's mouth to see how sensitive they were. Unfortunately, they show increased sensitivity after the wasps emerge. So they do not lose their sense of taste. They can enjoy the taste of the leaf right to the end. They just don't eat it. So that was the answer. Then we thought, well, what about feeding control? If they can't, if they can't eat physically, then they can't eat. If I can stop them from the, the motor end, and if you think about eating in a caterpillar, there's two main things the caterpillar has to do. It has to bite the food, which I'll talk about second, and it has to swallow it. So it needs to swallow and it has to bite. So let's see what happens to those parts of the, the uh, motor system. So I did this with Carol Miles, there she is. You see it's fall in SUNY Binghamton. 
And uh, the frontal ganglion, which is this little tiny brain, now just, I know you're all biology students, but just in case some of you don't work on bugs, the brain of an insect is distributed throughout the body. They have lots of little brains instead of us. We have one big brain. But they have lots of little brains. And they have a special little brain called the frontal ganglion, whose job is to swallow. It basically does peristalsis. The, the gut squeezes the food down, and that's what it does. So we looked to see what was going on with it. So here's the frontal ganglion. Here's a dissection of the, the caterpillar. Oops. It doesn't uh, look very, doesn't look as attractive when it's uh, taken apart. Uh, so here is, I just want the mouse. There it is. This ribbed structure is their, is their uh, throat, their esophagus. And this little brain here, whoops, let me find the, there we go. This little brain, that's the frontal ganglion. This is their big main brain. So this brain here, that's the frontal ganglion, and here it is in real life. So we, the, the uh, manduka, the caterpillars, will continue to swallow even if you take them apart like this. That's one of the joys of working with a bug. So we can hook up electrodes to the, the, the nerves, and we can see what happens. Oh, and I'm just reminding you, remember, octopamine goes up after, uh, after the wasps emerge. It turns out when we recorded from these nerves that octopamine was capable of disrupting the pattern of activity. So here's a control animal. These bursts of activity are what create the nice coordinated squeezing in the gut. This is what happens after you add high levels of octopamine. That pattern dies. And if you look at parasitized animals, they don't have that pattern either. The pattern has disappeared. The neurons are still firing, but they have lost their pattern. So instead of having a nice squeeze <laughs> to get the food down the gut, it has this, these uncoordinated tremors, and the food goes nowhere. Well, that's part of it. But the truth is, it's not like the caterpillars bite, and then they can't swallow, and the food falls out of their mouth. They don't eat. They do nothing. They sit on that leaf, staring at that food that they can taste, but they don't bite it. So what's going on with that? Maybe they can't bite. Biting is controlled in another part of the brain called the subesophageal ganglion. So this was the frontal ganglion. Here's the big main brain. And this is the subesophageal sub ganglion, which fortunately for us, someone has worked out the neural circuits that are important for biting. So we can now look and see, well, what, what's, are they OK? So I'm not going to show you all those details, which are really only exciting to neurophysiologists. But I'm just going to get cut to the chase. And the truth is that if you cut the connectives so that the subesophageal is no longer connected to the central nervous system, you can get bite behavior back, which is pretty exciting. So if it's as if you have removed some inhibition from the brain, you now get them, they'll start to bite. It's like you've turned on the motor. And if you look at these are EMG recordings, recordings from the muscle, the main muscle that controls the mandibles chewing, you can see they look pretty normal once you've got them to do it again. And when we've done measurements, there's some slight differences, but they're pretty subtle. OK, so what does this mean? It means the wasp is not preventing them from tasting. And the wasp is not interfering them with, with biting. It does seem to be doing a number on their ability to swallow. But that doesn't really explain why they're not eating. So now we have to go to the main brain, because it's the main brain that determines when this is where the sensory information from the mouth goes into the brain, and it's the brain that decides whether or not to eat. So we think the problem is in the main brain. It's a motivational problem, really, that the caterpillar has. So now we have to go into the main brain. Um, we've just started this work, so unfortunately, again, I don't have a ton of data to show you. What I can show you, though, is that if you, this is work not by me, this is by my former postdoc supervisor, Nancy Beckage, did a study looking at immunohistochemistry 
and found changes after the wasps have left the, the caterpillar, there are changes in the levels of all these neuropeptides, not just one or two. She had to stop here because those are the only antibodies she had that she knew that worked. That doesn't mean these are the only ones. We have decided to go the proteomics route. So right now we are grinding up brains and we are looking for cha brain changes in proteins and small peptides. And I want to see when, and I want to see where, and I want to see what. And so that's what we're doing. So this is just showing you some, uh, just a one protein gel. This is before we've done our advanced proteomics. It's all I've got right now. But you can see that prior to emergence, there's not a lot of difference in the protein spectra between a normal brain and a um, parasitized brain until the wasps emerge. And I think you can appreciate there are now a lot of new proteins, different levels of proteins. What you really want to know, and the same one day later, what you really want to know is what I really want to know, which is what are they? And I don't know yet. Right now I'm working with um, Dr. David Biron, my, my collaborator, and we're just in the middle of the bioinformatics and trying to figure this all out. When you throw a brain into these um, liquid chromatography tandem MS systems, you get about 300,000 bits of protein back. And you have to put that puzzle back together again. So that's what we're doing. Wish us luck. So let's recap. What's going on? Well, we know that the, the pattern, the rhythm of swallowing is disrupted in the frontal ganglion. We know there are lots of changes in the brain, but the subesophageal ganglion, that circuitry is pretty much intact. So what can we conclude? What are the wasps doing? Well, they're clearly, it looks pretty clear that they're hijacking immune neural connections to help them do what they do. They're also secreting neuromodulatory neuromodular, substances. They've got, an, they've got a local anesthetic in them, I swear. They use redundant mechanisms. Why use so many? Why one, wouldn't one, just one do? But they use multiple ones. And lots of changes in the central brain. Lots of changes, at least in neuropeptide activity. So then what can we say, that's just my, my caterpillar brain, but what can we say more generally about what these, type, these parasitic manipulators are doing. This is a hall, these are all hallmarks of parasitic manipulators. The few systems we know something about all have these features in common. They tend to use multiple mechanisms simultaneously and redundancy is common. There's no neuroanatomical specificity. That's not something parasites do. And they like to exploit host behavioral control mechanisms. Get your host to do the heavy lifting when it comes to changing behavior. That's not the way we do it. We hit either one brain region or one neurotransmitter system with a hammer. And that doesn't always work so well. So that's why I think we have lots to learn from parasitic manipulators. So I'd like to thank my collaborators and of course my students as everyone knows, labs don't run without students, right? We'd all just be dead in the water. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. So other than seeing the gross video again, does anyone have any questions? That's, you know, this is an old, old system. We think that these two, host and parasite, have been together for millions of years. And in this particular system, pretty much the wasp won. So if the, the, cat, the wasp is able to inject her eggs, it's 100% successful. The, 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 the caterpillar never wins. The only time the caterpillar wins is if it swirls around and snaps the wasp in half. But once that wasp, she injects not just eggs, she injects venom and she also injects a virus. And if those three things together, again, redundancy, if those three things get in there, 
that caterpillar is reproductively dead. Even if you just have wasp and the virus, they won't go through metamorphosis. They keep growing, they don't stop feeding. They, they grow forever until they're about 12 grams. It's a really big caterpillar, and then they die. Yeah, so, so it, m many systems are in a way slightly more interesting because it is more of a battleground, but somewhere in evolution this battle got lost. Yes, they do. So they have a nice, robust nervous system. It's small, but they have a brain in their, in their head, and then they have mini brains all the way down their trunk. So they have the little mini brain to control swallowing, a main brain for learning, because they have to learn a few things, and for being the master controller, and they have another brain that controls their, their mouth parts. So the parasite, amazingly, doesn't touch the brain. It doesn't contact it. So it's secreting things that make its host secrete things like hormones and cytokines to change its behavior. I think it's doing more than that. I think it's secreting things that are causing changes in the brain, but that we don't know yet. Ah, you know what? That is not the first time someone has asked me. I think as humans, <laughs> we have an advantage because we have a very big brain. Imagine a parasite trying to control your huge brain. You know, your brain is like a huge ship. It's hard to steer. There are some um, somewhat controversial examples of parasites that get into human brains. The, the big one is toxo, toxoplasma, toxoplasma gondii, which is a one cell organism that is found in undercooked meat and kitty poop. So don't change the litter box, get somebody else to do that. And um, it uh, causes the, the little um, parasite goes into your brain and it makes like a little cyst in your neurons. Whether it influences your behavior, where's Xavier? He can tell you, he knows the answer. Anyway, there's people who are working on that question right now. I, I'm not sure, to be honest, but, but some people say yes, some people say no. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. They, they call it fatal attraction. Yes. Yes, so I think, I think the secret to Toxo, and this is just my theory, and I don't work on this, so take this with a, we would say in English, a grain of salt, not seriously. I think part of it has to do with the load, and this is true. So if you look, first of all, mouse unfortunately isn't as good a model as rat, because in the mouse brain, what happens with Toxo is it stays in the active stage where it's, you've actually got neuroinflammation. The, the most work has been done with rodents, with rats, rats in particular, um, because, and they're the ones that show the really strong fatal attraction. This is when the, the parasite is, is in its latent phase and it's just hanging out in those neurons. I think it, it's a dose response is gonna be an issue. You have to have some minimum amount because what it actually does according to McConkie is that the, the, they're not so inert, those, those uh, bradyozoites, the little, the little parasites. They actually are secreting an enzyme that boosts dopamine production in dopamine-containing cells. So it does alter brain chemistry. So the question is, do you have enough change to overcome the homeostatic mechanisms in the brain? So I think you would have, have to have enough of them to do that so I think it's possible, but I think if you only had a few in a human brain, might not be enough.
But that's my speculation. I may be wrong. Yes. Yes, yeah, so in this particular wasp, the venom doesn't seem to be attacking the central nervous system. It seems to be targeting the host immune system. And so it helps with the, with the virus. It helps to suppress the host immune response so it doesn't attack the eggs. And then once the eggs hatch, the little wasp larvae have their own mechanisms, which we think are molecular mimicry. So the wasp venom, which is, again, a cocktail of... Fun of, of of chemicals. People have studied a few of them for the effect on the immune response and looking for novel ways of killing bugs, basically. But um, uh, they're not the sort of the exciting ones you might think of, which are actually targeting particular receptors on neurons. So those are, those are particularly um, another group of hymenopterans, and they make some wicked venoms. Yeah. So, um, so that's, a, that's a really interesting question you might, I don't know if you know this, but this is a very exciting field now, immunonutrition. How does your nutrition influence your ability to resist disease? And not just like you're not getting enough, but, but you know, what if you're getting more protein? What if you're getting more carbohydrates? And so there are people who study this with um, uh, caterpillars and other insects, uh, sort of, um, what do they call it, geometric Jorge would know. Geomet is it, it's Simpson's work, right? Geometric, um, what is it, geometric nutrition? It's, they, 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 they give them like 30 different diets. They use hundreds of caterpillars. And the answer is to your question is yes, it makes a difference. Not so much to the venom, and maybe not in this system, but in systems where it's more of a battle. Like this system, as I said, I think the wasp won this one, but in systems where it's a battle between the parasite and the host, it can be key. So, and as a matter of fact, some caterpillars, this is Mike Singer's work, will switch their diet when they get sick, when they get parasites, and will try to get a more protein-rich diet or a diet with interesting chemicals from plants to help them to get rid of the parasite. Yeah, so why are there any? Well, I'll tell you what I think happens is that it's a seasonal thing. The caterpillars come out in the field, and the wasps, and I don't know why, they tend to come out a little later. And as the season progresses, more and more and more caterpillars become parasitized. And in some fields, it can reach almost 100%. So I think that what happens is that the wasps first have to find them, and they have to make sure they themselves aren't destroyed while they're trying to lay their eggs. It takes them a few seconds. I think that that defensive strike is actually key to why it isn't 100% everywhere, and it's a mechanical defense is their best defense. But I, to be honest, I'm not a, a specialist in the ecology of the system, and lots of people are working on it, and I know that it, it is a question that, that people are trying to sort out, and there's a huge literature on how, um, how difficult it is for parasites, parasitic wasps to find their host and their search patterns and how they go about it. So I think that um, the ability of the caterpillar to hide in tobacco, which has a strong scent, and on the underside of leaves makes them, between that and the defensive strike is the two reasons they're not completely gone. Only survives in the caterpillar. So, so it, it, yeah, it doesn't have, um, it has, it can hit 
a couple of other caterpillars. It doesn't have to be Manduca sexta, this wasp, but it doesn't have a very broad host range. And that is true for most parasitic wasps. They're usually looking for their soulmate, their, their, their species. They usually don't have a very broad host range because as you can see, all the specializations they need to actually make a go of it, to survive inside a host. Parasites that live on the outside tend to require fewer specializations and often have a broader species range. But these endoparasites, it's usually only closely related species and sometimes just one. Ah, yes. So I have, <laughs> I have theories about this. So it's interesting. They, they sting, and they will lay anywhere between 10 and 80. But they do tie 10 and 80 to maybe 150. And what they but the wasp mum is no fool. She lays the number of eggs depending on the size of the caterpillar. So I think what she does is ensure that she does not over parasitize the host. And she is very precise. And Nancy Beckage, my, my previous uh, supervisor, that was one of the things that she spent a lot of time on. She had them parasitizing all these different uh, ages and or different sizes. So it's quite precise. I think that's how they do it. Because there should be some competition that the, the female Khatija wasp, the female wasp, mates multiply. So some of those wasp larvae are not that closely related. So there should, be, there should be selection on them to make sure that there's no competition. Because I think the host is always large enough, it might be more costly to try to get rid of the competition than to just grow yourself. And I think that's what happened. In other systems, which you probably know about, there are parasitic wasps where the larvae yeah, OK, they go. They have the soldier cast that go around and chew up any other larvae that are in there. Uh, but that, this species doesn't do that. Ah, so, so my theory is, when it comes to what's happening inside the, the caterpillar, mum does the heavy lifting. By injecting the venom and the polydna virus, that creates the change in the host's immune system and the host's endocrine system. I think those larvae should be selfish, which means the only time they're releasing things is when they really need to. That's why I think they piggyback on the host's immune system, because they have to do it anyway. It's low cost. And the, 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 um, uh, the anesthetic, the local anesthetic, they have to make that or they'll get killed, so they have to do that. But anything else, my, I think some of those long-term brain changes I'm suspicious that the polydna virus is involved. Again, because I agree with you, I don't think those larvae are going to be doing anything for the good of the family. Oh, I never did. This is what happens when you have a physiologist come and give a talk. They, they don't show you where anything's from. Uh, the, uh, the caterpillar is found in the uh, north and southeast of the U.S. and southern Canada, and the parasitic wasp has the same distribution. Oh. That's right. So I think, I think what happens is that there's a multiple phases in this. I think the first phase is as they're drilling, they are causing a massive activation of the host's immune system, maybe augmenting it chemically, or maybe just because they're drilling through the body wall. And as they're shedding their last larval instar, I think suddenly they stop whatever they were doing to try to hide from the host. And now they re raise the red flag, I'm here. And the host's immune system goes ballistic. 
and it starts to release PSP. PSP, I think, yes, massively activates all the circuits it's supposed to. And that's part of the reason the animal doesn't feed, at least for those first day. What, how, why it doesn't feed ever again? I think that's a slightly different story, and we don't know that yet. Oh, so for like, so that's a good point that the melanization requires um, tyrosine derivatives and octopamine is a tyrosine derivative, except you need nanograms of, ty of octopamine. Because it's a neurohormone, you don't need a lot. It's not like a substrate for um, a chemical reaction. So when you're talking about neuromodulators, you need tiny, tiny amounts. So if you're thinking of your budget, it's minuscule. Yeah, I don't think it's a conflict. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Are there neurons that have both an octopamine receptor and a PSP receptor? I'm working on it, but that's actually difficult to do. We're gonna have to do confocal microscopy and we don't have antibodies to the receptors. It's just, it's a problem when you don't work on Drosophila. Whenever I see a Drosophila talk, I get Drosophila envy. I want those tools. So it's gonna be a lot more work for us. <laughs> oh, so that's, uh, we, do, we do terrible things to bugs. We all do, everyone in this room, I'll bet, does terrible things to bugs. That's a really long conversation. My short, short answer is, it's hard to know the inner workings, the inner life of another organism, but given the size of the brain and its neural architecture, they do not feel pain like we do. So it's not like what we have. Is it anything? That's a much harder question to ask. And I'm going to be very curious to look at the Drosophila connectome. The brain connectome's just out. But the answer will be there. How does it wire up the different parts of its brain that's doing complex analysis? And as far as we know, the Drosophila doesn't have an emotional center. So that also speaks against pain. Like, would you call something pain if there was no cognition or emotion involved? Would it be pain? No, I don't think so. But it's, it's a tough, it's, it, it, it's one of those questions that veers into philosophy, which only old biologists are supposed to do. So I think, I think I'm done with that. Oh, sorry, one, yes. No. In, in, in this particular system, because it has co-evolved for so long, if the host goes, that wasp is dead. It has very few alternative caterpillars. So as long as maybe a closely related uh, Manduca quinquillata instead of Manduca sexta, but let's say all of that group went. I don't think that parasitic wasp would have the time to, it would need another million years to be able to find another host. And I think it's so super specialized now, I think it would be hard. Yes. Parasites are terrible for that, aren't they? Because, you know, a lot of parasites have multiple intermediate hosts. How did that ever happen? Why would you pick more than one? Why would you even have one intermediate host? Why don't you go straight to the reproductive cycle? I, I don't understand myself, so I can't give you a good answer. Um, I, it must have seemed like a good idea at the time. The one thing I can say is this is the, the difference between intelligent design and evolution. If I were designing a species, I'd get rid of all the intermediate <laughs> hosts because it would be much faster. If you want to go into a cat, just stay in the cat's gut. I don't know what you're doing. Why are you trying to get through a mouse? That's me. But um, I think with evolution, 
animals are in a mouse, and then they find out that the cat is actually a great place, but they still use the mouse for some life stages. It's, that's what happens with T. Gandhi. T. Gandhi does one of its life stages in the mouse, and it does the sexual life stage in the cat. They now know, it turns out, that there's a chemical in the cat gut. So maybe cats don't eat feces enough, and the rodents eat the feces, so they end up often in rodents, so they've evolved to do part of their life stage in rodents. But for reasons I cannot fathom, they really love this chemical in the cat gut, so they do their sexual reproduction in the cat gut. That's not a very good answer, and I, that's a very good question, and I'm still waiting for someone to answer it myself. <laughs> oh, there was more, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Get into the digestive system. Oh, that is so cool. So again, this is where someone else, someone who's a parasitologist might, Jorge, do you know the answer to that question? So yes, someone may know. I think, it's, I think it is one of the unanswered questions in biology. How did complex life cycles and parasites really evolve? And to be fair, I do know people have done work on it. <laughs> I just don't know what they've said, so I don't know. But um, I, I think it's still an outstanding problem. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very Oh, wait, sorry, I didn't want to cut anyone off. Yeah. Not physically, that is correct. They do not physically touch it. So we, we know what we know is we've dissected them at various stages, and we never, ever find them next to the nervous system. Nancy Beckage, my supervisor, did occasionally sometimes find at the very end that one would be sticking into the, in, between the, the supra and the sub, but it didn't seem to matter whether it's there or not. And so when you open them up, they're always in the hemocele. And we did CT. We did x-rays so you can see them. And what's really cool, I didn't show you because it's just a secret sequence of stills. You can see how they reorient their bodies and go swim to the body wall to start to get out. But never did we see them anywhere near the nerve cord. The nerve cord is in a pile of fat, so they have to burrow through the fat to get at it. And they're almost never in the head capsule. They're usually at the back end of the animal because there's more oxygen there. Michael Land showed that years ago, that they have higher oxygen tension. So almost all the larvae in the back end. And so that's so from the CT scan, from the dissections, and just the fact that you just never find them in the head capsule, very rarely, unless they're highly, highly parasitized, makes me think that there's no evidence for physical contact. Chemical for sure. I just, I'm not certain, just like we talked about. I, the reason I haven't pushed the chemicals so much is I think there's something there, but remember the larvae are not that closely related. So what would stop cheaters from not secreting. So in other words, I think that system probably doesn't rely heavily on expensive, at least expensive, neuromodulatory substances. I think they're doing clever tricks that are cheap that cause the host to do the work. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I've impressed you with how good parasitic manipulators are. Thank you, Shelley.
Your call will be disconnected. Se desconectará la llamada.